Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Donna Casella, and I'm the Interim Director and Chair of the Board of Trustees at the New Britain Museum of American Art. Before I turn the program over to Maura O'Shea, our Director of Education, to introduce Betsy Kornhauser, I'd like to recognize some organizers and key supporters of this wonderful exhibition with its associated programming. I would like to extend the museum's profound gratitude to New York Historical Society staff for their generous collaboration, including Vice President and Museum Director Margie Hoffer, Deputy Museum Director Emily Kroll, Collections Registrar Mark Schlemmer, and many other staff there who provided invaluable assistance. Thank you to exhibition curator and director emerita of the New York Historical Society Museum, Dr. Linda Ferber, for conceiving this exquisite presentation of Hudson River School paintings. Our gratitude and immense appreciation to Kay Cox for her generous support by the Catherine Cox Special Exhibitions Fund. Additional support provided by the Bailey Family Fund for special exhibitions and special exhibition fund donors, Marion and Russell Burke and John Howard. Today's program and the Poetry of Nature programs are made possible by John and Sandra Jasowski the Tommaso family in memory of Jim Tommaso and Connecticut Humanities. Additional support for our programs is provided by Sharon and Dave Jepson, Allison and Jay Bambara, Donna and Michael Casella, Kelly and Jonathan Jarvis, and Ken Cariffa and Mark Garavel. In-kind support was provided by Thomas Mack Interiors who we can thank for enhancing the exhibition with beautiful wall color. And I am personally grateful to my colleagues here at the museum and to our members and patrons for your continued support of the New Britain Museum of American Art. I'd like to now turn the program over to Mara, who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Mara? Thank you so much, Donna, and welcome everyone. It's such an honor to introduce our keynote lecturer, Dr. Elizabeth Mencken Kornhauser, a distinguished scholar, curator, author, and lecturer. Dr. Kornhauser has inspired and educated generations of scholars, collectors, students, and lovers of American art, and has been a wonderful friend to the NBMAA for many, many years. For over two decades, Dr. Kornhauser served in various roles at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, including Deputy Director, Chief Curator, and Kriebel Curator of American Paintings, where she greatly enhanced the collections with major purchases and gifts of American art and organized numerous exhibitions, ranging from Ralph Earl, The Face of the Young Republic, Aspects of the Hudson River School, and Marston Hartley, and more. In 2010, Dr. Kornhauser was appointed the Alice Pratt Brown Curator of American Paintings and Sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she oversees the American Paintings Collection and participated in its major 2012 reinstallation. At the Met, she's co-curated numerous exhibitions, including Thomas Hart Benton's America Today Mural Rediscovered, the Met's 2015 presentations of Sargent, Portraits of Artists and Friends, and Thomas Cole's Journey, Atlantic Crossings, to name a few. Before I more formally welcome Dr. Kornhauser to begin, I'm just going to invite all of you to chat questions that you may have. And Dr. Kornhauser has graciously agreed to respond to your questions directly um, after the lecture or in the very near future. So now I'd like to welcome you, Betsy. And thank you so much for joining us today to present your talk, Rethinking the Hudson River School, From Proto-Environmentalism to Manifest Destiny. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Mara. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, 
I'm so pleased to be speaking about this uh, wonderful exhibition, uh, which is drawn from the very distinguished uh, collection of the New York Historical Society, uh, one of our country's earliest museums, um, founded in 1804, and one that has one of the great collections of Hudson River School paintings. Um, so it's a pleasure to be asked to do this. And I wanna thank all of you. I understand we have a, a really wonderfully large audience today joining us on this incredibly snowy uh, weekend. So thank you. And I, I'm sure many of you are old friends of mine from my uh, wonderful years in Hartford. So nice to have you here. Um, my talk today is gonna focus on the Hudson River School which was, you know, has had a kind of romanticized history over time. And um, as most of you know, in the last many years, curators, scholars, and the public at large have been asking um, bigger questions about American art. And certainly because of the importance of the Hudson River School, um, that has been a focus for um, a great deal of new scholarship and research. And so, I'm going to ambitiously try to touch on some of the major uh, new focuses, um, which this show beautifully encapsulates, by the way, uh, in my talk today. Um, the Hudson River School was a fraternity of painters that by the mid 19th century were working in New York City together with like-minded poets and writers. And they developed a distinctly American vision of the uh, landscape. Their depictions of American wilderness and cultivated scenery would later be dubbed the Hudson River School, helping to shape both the national and cultural identity of the United States. Um, I hope to um, you know, provide sort of a, a, just a rough overview, but at the same time, touch on some of the new areas that were neglected in the kind of um, accepted history of the Hudson River School, which was in some ways, very simplistic. Um, I'm going to look at the strong influence of the old world on the early Hudson River School painters and how important that was. Um, the new discipline of eco-criticism, um, which looks at artists' awareness of environmental changes, um, will be applied to Thomas Cole in particular, who is now considered the um, earliest proto-environmental artist in the United States. Indigenous peoples um, and the land is a, is a huge topic of concern and inquiry for um, uh, curators and scholars these days. And um, so I'll touch on the ways in which Hudson River School painters did and did not acknowledge um, this earlier history. Um, there are also wonderful new discoveries uh, regarding artists of color who were participants in the Hudson River School. And more recently, excellent research on um, a growing number of women artists who um, participated uh, in uh, painting the American landscape art. And finally, I'll touch on the extraordinary legacy of Hudson River School um, painters on our contemporary artists. Um, but I'm going to begin with the acknowledged founder of the school, Thomas Cole, um, who uh, was a towering figure uh, when we think about the history of the Hudson River School. Um, Cole, by the time of his sudden death at age 47 in 1848, he was recognized as a leading landscape painter in the United States. While most previous accounts of Cole's career have closely identified him with the young American nation, his career was actually marked by extensive transatlantic travel and engagement with European art and thought. His global engagement would paradoxically fuel Cole's ambition as a leader of the National School, the Hudson River School movement in the United States. And it inspired his spiritual and cultural commitment to the American wilderness, which was a very novel new subject for American art. Um, he remained throughout his life loyal to an earlier 18th century Republican mindset. His art was cautionary, not celebratory, as we'll see uh, later on in the uh, mid-century artists such as Frederick Church and Asher B. Durand. 
um, he envisioned a national destiny um, founded um, not on manifest destiny, but on cautionary <clears throat> um, tales of the rise and decline of earlier civilizations. Cole's early formation was not American, which really has to be a point made for most visitors who, who come to Thomas Cole, but he was British. He was born in 1801 at the height of the Industrial Revolution in bolton le near Manchester in Northwestern England. It was polluted and overcrowded. Bolton was surrounded, um, however, by wild and beautiful countryside. Though the nation's new prosperity derived from industry, few artists attempted to paint the modern industrial city. But here on the screen are examples of works that Cole may well have um, had access to. Philip de Lutherberg reveled in the sublime, demonic spectacle of the forges and factories in the region in which Cole grew up in. And uh, J.M.W. Turner, um, painted this beautiful um, large watercolor of the town of Leeds in uh, near uh, Thomas Cole's hometown when Cole was just a boy of 15 living nearby, uh, where he was at that time working himself in a factory. During Cole's childhood, Bolton saw machine breaking and arson attacks by the Luddites, groups of unemployed workmen whose jobs had been replaced by new, new machinery. And times were very hard. Um, the failure of his father's business, um, which was handwork, forced the teenage Thomas, who was well-educated and interested in poetry and music, to take employment in a factory, where he worked as an engraver for the blocks which um, produced calico uh, colorful cotton fabrics. Um, the Cole family would become economic migrants, unable to make a living in England, they sailed for the New World, the United States, in 1818, arriving in Philadelphia. As a new arrival in the United States, Cole, who was then 17, carried memories of his youth of the horrors of the Industrial Revolution throughout his lifetime. He was determined to become a painter, which is, you know, really admirable and courageous. Um, but he really lived hand to mouth for several years. Um, picking up education where he could. Um, and he would find himself in Philadelphia where he was exposed to the then growing um, print culture of American landscape scenery, mainly produced by recent English emigres. And here you see a wonderful example in the exhibition uh, at New Britain um, by John Hill after a watercolor by William Guy Wall of the Palisades of the Hudson River which was reproduced in the very famous Hudson River portfolio. So this was, you know, an early influence on Cole's work. But he very famously arrived in New York City in 1825 and took a ferry that summer um, up the Hudson River, a steamboat up the Hudson River, where he made sketches in the area around Catskill, which was already beginning to become a tourist destination and had um, a newly built hotel. His oil paintings of the region were an instant success. And on the screen, you see one of the extraordinary examples um, entitled Catterskill Falls, um, which shows him using you know, many radical new devices. He, his focus is on the American wilderness, which is, was a new subject for landscape art. He uses a dramatic vertical format to capture the several la you know, layers of falls that made up this great natural wonder. Um, he focuses on the fall scenery, um, which was distinctive to America. And he, this is a detail, he shows the sole figure of a Native American as a symbol of what the landscape looked like before white settlement. When in fact, by this time, 1826, coal would have been surrounded by tourists climbing the rocks. The New Britain Art Museum has another great early example in their collection, the Clove Catskill, which has the same sublime elements that we saw in the previous work. And Cole did paint a large figure of a Native American on the ledge in dead center, but painted it out because it was overly large. But this really points to the fact that 
Cole and other artists of the time had accepted the fact that Native Americans were no longer on the land when in fact they had been moved off these northeastern lands, um, beginning to be moved out west to reservations. Uh, but their presence was essentially denied uh, in these paintings. It was a sort of romanticized image. He would go on to you know, move beyond his pure landscape imagery to create what he described was a higher style of landscape art. And here you see him referencing um, a literary very subject from the very popular newly published novel by his friend, um, James Fenmore Cooper from The Last of the Mohegans. And he uses dramatic, uh, actually it's psychosexual imagery um, in this painting. Um, and again, um, picking up on this, the themes of Cooper's novel, it's looking at the pure wilderness of what white settlers now like to see as the past uh, in American history. Um, but he would soon um, aspire to, um, to expand his career further. Um, and at the age of 28, he would follow the example of several earlier American artists and make a grand tour to Europe. He was famously cautioned by his friend, the nature poet and writer, William Cullen Bryant, not to be too dazzled by what he saw in the old world, the art and the ancient history and ruins, because there was a great fear that Cole might not return. And so in his sonnet to Cole, the painter departing for Europe in 1829, he would write, gaze on them till the tears shall dim thy sight, but keep that earlier wilder image bright. He um, first arrived in London, uh, which was regarded um, at this time as the most important um, a political and mercantile hub, um, part of the British Empire, and a modern city of a million people um, by this point, a leading capital in Europe. Um, he left for Europe uh, in 1829, where he would um, spend several years uh, traveling and would take advantage while in London, um, looking at the grand art collections. He visited the newly opened National Gallery and was enraptured by the landscapes of the 17th century French painter Claude Lorraine. Um, he would engage with the major contemporary artists of the time. Um, he, he was very impressed with J.M.W. Turner's art, in particular, um, Snowstorm, Hannibal and his army crossing the Alps, which he saw in his first year there. Um, the swirling vortex deeply moved Cole. He would write about all these works in his journals. And uh, it would be um, a landscape element using a storm as a narrative um, for many of his later paintings. But when he personally encountered Turner, he was a little disappointed in the kind of roughshod um, appearance uh, of this very famous artist. He also made friends with um, the British painter uh, John Constable. He saw Hadley Castle at this time, um, a, a grand scale work that deeply affected him. The, um, this ruin um, in a bare landscape uh, is an image he would carry with him and reincorporate in later works. And um, he saw the great six footer, as these paintings were called, they were six feet long, um, Constable's opening of Waterloo Bridge, which was a celebration of the British Empire uh, and of their maritime uh, prowess. Um, but it again plays into Cole's concerns about rapid expansion. Um, and the dangers of um, great empires uh, in his later work. He also um, very importantly saw the extraordinary um, plein air oil st studies of clouds by John Constable. And these small, rapidly executed, brilliantly captured images of clouds deeply impressed Cole. And he would go on to um, really master this art form. and and. Um, this was something that wasn't previously credited to Cole. He mastered the art form and he would teach it to the earliest members of the Hudson River School. Cole went on to Italy, uh, to first to Florence, where he studied um, uh, life drawing classes at the, Acad the Academia de Belle Arte in, in Florence. And you can see a really impressive example on the right of his mastery of the nude form. 
He was also very taken with um, Florence itself and the uh, great architecture of the city. And he would begin to develop his panoramic format, which would become a signature of later Hudson River School painting. Um, you can see he does a panoramic sweeping drawing, capturing all of the architecture of the city uh, in his sketchbook, and then created this beautiful panoramic view of Florence, um, which is considered the um, earliest scene of this uh, subject by an American artist. And he highlighted the impressive buildings, uh, providing a literal chronology of medieval and Renaissance architecture from the 14th century onward, uh, which is a, a really a testament to the mastery of Cole's skills. He then went on to Rome, where he visited um, the Vatican. Um, Rome was considered the greatest city for tourists and artists of the time, and he would encounter fellow American artists along the way. Um, he had a painting room that he rented um, on the uh, Pincian Hill, which was believed to have been the studio of Claude Lorraine. And later on in his career, on his return to the United States, he would be referred to as our American Claude. Um, he uh, felt that of all the ruins he encountered, and he, he really traveled extensively around the city and outside the city, he was most taken with the ancient Colosseum. And he would write in his journal, from the multitude of wondrous things, I would select the Colosseum as the object that affected me the most. It is stupendous yet beautiful in its destruction but now it is all desolation. So he's referring to the rise and fall of this great civilization. Cole returned to the United States after this transformative journey um, and would settle uh, there and really becoming an American artist. And he would take up two of his most important um, subjects uh, simultaneously during this time. Upon his return, um, in 1832, he was very disheartened that Andrew, President Andrew Jackson, who he truly despised, um, had been um, elected into a second uh, term as president. And he became very aware of the changes in the American landscape, even since his departure um, just a few years before. Um, he held deep anxieties about the ecological danger presented by the rise of modern industry, the growth of cities, uh, what he described as the ravages of the axe in his journal, and the worship of money. Um, in his famous essay on American scenery, which he published in 1836, he asked the question of the American public as to whether the ruinous fate of past empires such as Rome would also befall modern America. A meager utility, writing, quote, a meager utilitarianism seems ready to absorb every feeling and sentiment, and what is sometimes called improvement, meeting the cultivation of landscape, in its march makes us fear that the bright and tender flowers of the imagination shall be crushed beneath its iron tramp. And this would become the, the subject and the question that he asked in both the Course of Empire series, this great five-part series that he um, uh, was commissioned to paint by Lumen Reed, the great patron of the New York Historical Society, and also the subject of his great painting, um, The Oxbow. He would move to um, the farmhouse in the Catskills uh, by 1836 and began um, painting this great five-part series there. And here he explores the rise and fall of great civilizations um, in this series, you know, the, the savage state where nature still rules supreme, then moving on to the Arcadian or pastoral state. Um, and you see that a mountain with a rocking stone on it is a constant presence in these paintings. And he begins in the spring and moves you through the different seasons. In the Arcadian state, he introduces many um, figures of artists and poets and the cultivation of landscape. But then we come to um, the worst effects of 
um, civilization and empire in the central painting in the series called the consummation of empire where nature the the mountain and rocking stone has been pushed to the side at the upper right barely evident and man's greed and ambition takes hold and you see the emperor crossing the bridge and uh, many scholars believe this is a stand-in for andrew jackson in fact um, and then the series goes on to destruction of empire um, with uh, the worst um, uh, human um, behavior of um, horrible destruction and murder and um, uh, the, again, nature pushed off to the right. And the inevitable, as we saw in the Colosseum, uh, desolation where nature begins to take hold again and there's no sign of human presence in this work. This is one of the great series of the New York Historical Society and one of the really great historic um, series of paintings ever painted by an American artist. Um, and I'm just showing you on le the left, the influence that uh, his time in Rome had um, on the ideas behind this great series. At the very same time, he for years he had wanted to paint the view from Mount Holyoke on top of um, uh, Mount Hillock Mountain looking over the Oxbow um, just below Northampton, Massachusetts. And um, he began again, one of the things, one of the new areas of research has been looking at the working methods of American artists, the way in which they began, you know, in Cole's case, he began with these on-site panoramic sweeping drawings. Um, he would then move to, in this case, sometimes plein air oil studies out of doors. In this case, a studio study where he captures all the ideas that he wanted um, for um, his important work um, and then um, completed this giant composition in his Catskill, New York studio. Um, he had only six weeks to paint this because he wanted it ready for the National Academy of Design spring show. Uh, so it's one of these cases where the idea had been in his head for years. He had basically explored the ideas about the destruction of landscape, the worst inclination of humans against nature in the course of empire. And he uh, presented them in a new way and a new radical way in his great painting, The Oxbow. So here we are on top of Mount Holyoke looking southwest to the very um, a distinguished oxbow shape on the Connecticut River. Um, and in this work, he would present extraordinary pictorial breakthroughs that would really define the later Hudson River School. The prospect view of all encompassing panorama with a bifurcated scene you see on the left, um, the distinctly wild, pure God's creation with a giant uh, Turneresque storm uh, and blasted trees coming sharply up against the right hand side, which was a over cultivated, uh, more muted landscape scene, which I will talk in a minute about, uh, which has um, areas of deforestation in it. Um, and so he basically is creating um, an interesting um, sort of compression of time and space in this work. And importantly includes an amazing self portrait dead center where he turns away from his plein air oil study, um, turns toward the viewer, looking straight at you, pointing his brush to his head to indicate that this is a painting about ideas. It's not, you know, a topographical beautiful scene at all. It's really his manifesto uh, to the his fellow American citizens to um, to preserve the, the most sublime aspects of nature as they were desperate to cultivate um, the landscape in a very rapid and um, damaging way. And in right beyond his self-portrait, you see on the mountain in the distance, a clear area of deforestation, which we know from historians was rampant in the Connecticut Valley at this time. Um, whole mountaintops were being cut down um, as the approach of the railroad and factory building was taking place. And interestingly, the um, deforestation that he shows in the mountaintop forms Hebraic letters. And this is a very coalesque thing to do. And 
Um, it's unclear whether his audiences at the time fully appreciated this, um, but he wanted you to understand that he was asking you this question. Are you willing to preserve the wilderness um, or are you just going to destroy um, the entire landscape in your, your quest to conquer it? Um, and so I'm just showing you these two again. And we also investigated these two paintings. They're exactly the same size, as I said, painted simultaneously and discovered through infrared reflectography that he um, painted the architectural plan for consummation under the Oxbow canvas, which linked the paintings even more strongly um, and which was a fascinating new uh, discovery for us um, to find. While working on the Oxbow, Cole wrote to his patron Lumen Reed to inform him that in his beloved Catskill Valley, which he could see right from the porch of his homestead, and I do encourage all of you to visit Cedar Grove, uh, Cole's homestead. He wrote to read, quote, the copper-hearted barbarians are cutting down all the trees in the beautiful valley on which I have looked so often with a loving eye. Um, and he was just horrified that this was happening. And so he, in this very same year, he painted a view of that scene, um, eliminating the signs of deforestation, in, including this bucolic family scene of the um, uh, view of the Catskill before the train arrived, and later on uh, painted a view of what happened um, when the train uh, arrived in his beautiful valley. And you see this, the typical coal symbols of the ax man holding an ax who's cut down many trees in the foreground and the train, uh, which he railed against in um, uh, his journal as a sort of anti-human um, machine made uh, object that he really detested. So he did not hold back uh, in any of his writings and his poetry about his feelings. Um, and a, a few years later, Cole would become the great teacher of Frederick Church. This would become one of his greatest legacies. As you know, Church was um, a Hartford native discovered by Daniel Wadsworth, who was one of Cole's greatest patrons. And um, he would encourage Cole to take him on as his student. And one of the great lessons that um, Church learned during his time in the studio from 1844 to 1846 was to um, his, to absorb Cole's extraordinary reverence for nature, they would go on trips through the Catskills and Cole would um, do his plein air drawings and teach Church to do them. And um, he, Church also had access to see some of the early plein air works by Cole. Here are some examples of oil studies that Cole did on the coast of Maine later in his career. And we find Church moving on and, he, and becoming possibly one of the greatest plein air painters of all time. He, I, in my opinion, he really does rival John Constable um, in the way in which um, he was able to create these masterful oil, plein air oil studies. And this, this artistic technique that Cole learned in England and Italy, and then imparted to church. And then um, here's just another great example later in Church's life of his greatest creation, Olana. Um, he would also teach to Asher B. Durand, who um, was older than Church and Cole, and in fact was one of the artists who, who, who uh, famously discovered Cole in 1825 in New York. Uh, but at that time he was an engraver and he became a good friend of um, Cole's and he would travel with Cole through the Catskills and they would write about these trips in their journals where Cole um, introduced him to plein air, plein air oil study. And in your exhibition are two very beautiful examples of Duran's masterful plein air forest studies and tree studies, um, uh, which really added to um, his abilities uh, as a great American artist. At the uh, untimely death of Thomas Cole, Durand would paint this great tribute to the master um, who uh, was greatly mourned by the New York art world. And here you have this uh, extraordinary view where Durand brings together all their favorite painting sites, the Clove, Catterskill Falls, 
um, merging these together. And he has a view of uh, Thomas Cole with his great friend and nature poet, William Cullen Bryant, <clears throat> standing on a ledge with the tools of their, um, their arts, introducing the American public to the pure wilderness. And you see an eagle flying uh, through um, the sky, probably Cole uh, going to heaven. It's one of the very uh, most famous works um, of the Hudson River School. But soon after Cole's death, the leading, many of the leading Hudson River School painters began to embrace um, paintings that reflected the mid-century quest of manifest destiny, which was to lay, um, to really lay claim to the American landscape. This idea that white settlers were God's chosen people destined to lay claim to the land. And interestingly, in this great work, which is now actually in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, it's a bifurcated landscape, uh, which Durand is almost paying homage to Thomas Cole's Oxbow, but he has the opposite message here. On the left are two figures of Native Americans in a dark wilderness um, scene to the far left, overlooking this extraordinary, the advance of civilization, uh, progress, the title of the painting, where all forms of, you know, ca carriage roads, boat traffic, factories, trains, and then the kind of Turner-esque light drawing white settlers as they moved westward, laying claim to the land as they displaced uh, Native Americans along the way. And this was, you know, a theme that pops up in, in a large number of Hudson River School paintings by our mid-century artists. Um, but I wanted to touch on um, a rare um, uh, ex uh, example of a work by an African-American artist, Robert Duncanson. You'll see two works in the show. Um, he was one of only a few 19th century American artists with a successful career um, and had an international reputation. Um, he was born in New York, but he relocated to Cincinnati, Ohio, which during the antebellum period was a area where slavery and the abolitionist movement was rife. And he was very, very influenced by Thomas Cole. He would go to Europe with a fellow artist, um, William Sontag, and uh, paint a uh, scenery of ruins, not unlike Thomas Cole's, but he also engaged in pure landscapes of the Ohio landscape. Uh, and he had to walk a very fine line, but did manage to imbue some of his works with abolitionist messages. So he's an artist that is um, being very carefully studied now um, uh, as of great importance to broaden um, our understandings of the Hudson River School. I also wanted to touch on the ways in which great American Hudson River School paintings were used um, as national images and actually redefined. During the Civil War, the Metropolitan Sanitary Fair uh, in New York City was one of the greatest gatherings of art it, that the country had ever seen. Abraham Lincoln had created the Sanitary Commission in 1861, which was intended to support Union Army soldiers and hospitals. And so there were many sanitary fairs. But in New York, a group of artists and great collectors um, uh, installed this great art gallery of the fair, where they put three major paintings in conversation with each other very deliberately. Here you see on the north wall, um, uh, Emmanuel Leutz's very famous Washington crossing the Delaware. And then um, on, the, uh, on the wall that was um, thought to be the south, we see Frederick Church's um, Heart of the Andes and directly across from it, Albert Bierstadt's Rocky Mountain Landers Peak. Um, so here is a William Brady photograph of the fair, which was uh, had over a million visitors. Um, and these paintings were put in direct conversation to fuel patriotism. So here we have Leutza's Washington Crossing the Delaware, a reminder of how hard the um, patriots had to fight to um, create the United States. And then um, Church's already famous work, Heart of the Andes, which he had in this great furniture style window into the tropical world of South America, influenced by the scientist Alexander von Humboldt, 
But to drive the message home, they borrowed three portraits from the New York Historical Society of the early president of the United States. And um, here's an image. This painting, you know, deserves a lecture in itself, but it's interesting to see how it was repurposed for this Civil War moment. And then across was um, Albert Bierstadt, perhaps Church's greatest competitor. They both had studios in the 10th Street Studio Building uh, and painted, sort of tried to outdo each other with grander sized landscapes. And his great Rocky Mountain Landers Peak um, was used to reflect the West. And there was a strong desire to, to unite the North and the West against the South. So people who attended the fair completely got this message that paintings could serve as patriotic reminders of the need to, you know, to stick with the Union Army, win the Civil War, and preserve the nation. Um, I also, you know, I should actually say that um, in this work by Albert Bierstadt, Native Americans, you know, he carefully studied, he went out on an expedition, studied Native American life and customs, but it's really a painting again about manifest destiny. Um, you know, trying to woo white settlers out to lands where Native Americans are just passing through and these are ripe for white settlement. And one of, we've had to uh, come to terms with this issue. Most museums have in their galleries. And one of the things we've done uh, in our American galleries at the Met is to sprinkle throughout our Hudson River School galleries um, labels that we call native perspectives. And this work by John Kensett, which shows the Hudson, you know, a view of the Hudson River with West Point in the distance, it has a curatorial label uh, written by me, in fact. But then we invited a member of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohegan tribe to write an alternate label. And I'm going to read this label to you. She writes, to me, every bend in the Muhekanakta, meaning Hudson River, is a beloved view. It is a fertile, life-giving place where Mohegan ancestors cultivated bountiful harvests and enjoyed tranquil canoe journeys downriver to exchange news, game, and other gifts with their Muncie kin. It is a sacred landscape from which our surviving community continues to derive pride and meaning. It is our namesake, the waters that are never still. It is home. The fort's presence is a reminder of the colonists' need to defend lands that were not their home. Today, that tension is still present, even if the forts are not. Every day we confront this truth as we work to protect burial places and other sacred sites. The theft is still unresolved. And the message is really that members of these tribes still live in this region. And we have this tendency, as the early Hudson River School artists did, uh, to put them in the past. They're not in the past. They're still very much present with us. Um, I also just wanted to touch on the later Hudson River School artists, Martin Johnson Heed, in this beautiful March, Marsh view. He painted hundreds of these. Um, we're also going to look at uh, John Kensett and Sanford Gifford quickly, who formed a later um, um, community of artists who traveled extensively in Europe and were exploring new, po more poetic approaches, more meditative approaches to the American landscape in the aftermath of the Civil War. And there's much work to be done on these artists. The term luminous really doesn't accurately just describe them, but there is a lot of new work being done uh, on these artists. Um, Sanford Gifford, who served in the Union Army, painted this uh, view of essentially light. Um, his favorite view in Catterskill Clove, he uh, was a meditative view to try to soothe his soul during the horrors of the Civil War era. And later on, we have John Kensett paring down his coastal views to just water, um, uh, sand, and sky in these extraordinarily radical works. So more work to be done on this later group of artists. And a, a new area of deep exploration um, are the Pre-Raphaelites, um, who were a short-lived movement of English, mainly English artists who arrived in New York in the 1860s, and they radically rebelled against their, um, the current uh, popular Hudson River School. Um, they were uh, very different from the Hudson River School in many ways. Um, they, were, uh, they were abolitionists. 
They were a political movement that wanted change to take place. Their approach to painting was very different. And you can see that in Thomas Farrer, he's taking on Thomas Cole's The Oxbow in this view, which he deliberately took from what was then the Hospital for the Insane in Northampton. And rather than privileging wilderness and cultivated scenery, and he basically equalizes everything um, in a straightforward view that for him made a very strong point. And it was this very moment that in the early 1870s, around 1870, the term Hudson River School comes into play. And um, it had never been used before. And it was used intentionally as a derogatory term to imply that the members of the Hudson River School were provincial artists. Um, and it's thought that perhaps it was these Pre-Raphaelite artists who first um, put that term out there in this negative way. We now accept it, um, and, and, but it really needs to be defined for the public. There's also great work being done on um, the presence of American women artists. And this is very new. Um, when I was asked years ago um, by the public, you know, why were women not part of the Hudson River School? You know, I, I said, you know, they weren't allowed to take formal drawing classes. Uh, they were not allowed to, to do large easel paintings. Um, they were not part of the fraternity of the Hudson River School where they, you know, were members of all the New York male clubs, the Century, the Union, the Knickerbocker. They couldn't have studios in the 10th Street Studio Building, on and on and on. But in recent years, there has been um, a lot of new wonderful work being done on American women artists. And uh, in the exhibition um, at uh, the New Britain Art Museum is this extraordinarily large and sublime view of the artist Louisa Davis Mino, who was in New York, but still very little known about her. And it's an absolutely stunning example of the sublime aspects of Niagara Falls. And it would be fascinating to know. You can see the date of 1818. So she's following in the footsteps of John Trumbull, going long before Thomas Cole goes to the falls and painting a grand scale view of extraordinary um, talent. And we know virtually nothing about her. So um, this is an artist uh, who needs attention. And another uh, later artist, Josephine Walters in your exhibition, um, was a student of Ashraf Durand and is painting a great forest interior, not unlike the views by her mentor, Duran. So clearly more work needs to be done because what we find is a lot of these women artists were either related to um, or were students of the better known members of the Hudson River School. I'd also just like to touch on another theme quickly of looking at major artists. Frederick Church was the most successful of the Hudson River School painters. He lived to the very end of the century um, and he was one of the greatest painters, no question, and he had a great international reputation. But as we delve into the lives of these artists, we discover that they had other important dimensions. One of Church's was the fact that he created one of his, perhaps his greatest artistic undertaking, which was his great homestead, Olana, um, which all of you, I'm sure many of you have gone, but you must go if you have not. And there's extraordinary work being done there, exploring um, not only the, the house and the significance of his art collections and the interiors, but a great deal of attention is being played to the very, very extensive landscape that forms this giant mountaintop overlooking the Hudson River. And how, again, like coal, church was aware, you know, as a proto-environmentalist, he was aware of the changing landscape and his desire was to preserve aspects of it and control it and open it up to the public. Um, and this inclination went further in his extraordinary role as one of the most important trustees of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, he was an original trustee at its founding in 1870. And he would work with Frederick Law Olmsted, who I know is being celebrated at the New Britain Art Museum this year, who was, um, 
you know, the most important leader of the Central Park, um, the establishment of Central Park. Church, as a, as a trustee of the net, worked with Olmsted to situate this extraordinary Egyptian obelisk uh, in 1880 called Cleopatra's Needle, which you can see it's directly behind the net. And so Church worked in many ways to help begin the art museum movement and to bring uh, art of the old world to the United States. Um, uh, so he was a central figure in establishing the arts. Um, in uh, the United States following the Civil War. And finally, I'm going to end my talk talking about the extraordinary legacy of the Hudson River School. There's, it's like all around you now, uh, but when I was a young student of this field, it wasn't something that I really thought much about. In fact, the first time was while during my tenure at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, we did a wonderful exhibition of Saul LeWitt's incomplete open cube sculptures. And um, I know the New Britain Art Museum um, celebrates Saul LeWitt, uh, their native son, um, uh, all the time. And so I thought I would put this in while I was working with Saul. I was not the curator of the show, but I was, um, you know, I had, he was a very generous artist. And um, he worked with, he, he said to all of us that the art of the Wadsworth Athenaeum and the New Britain Art Museum really influenced his conceptual works and that the Hudson River School was one of his favorite areas of art. And so we placed the cubes, you know, with Saul's help adjacent to the works that he had been very inspired by as a young artist. So this was the first time I encountered this, but then more directly when I was doing the Thomas Cole exhibition in um, 2018, I had to replace Thomas Cole's The Great Oxbow Painting because it was going on the road. Our show traveled, you know, it was in the exhibition here and then traveled to the National Gallery in London. And so I was so lucky to be able to borrow from our contemporary art department at the Met, Stephen Hannock's great um, version of the Oxbow, a gigantic canvas that um, really honors um, the original messages uh, many of them in uh, Thomas Cole's original work. And then I engaged the West Coast LA artist, Ed Ruscha, who very famously in 1992 did a two-part series, a direct response, as he um, talked about in a lecture he gave at the Met, um, a direct response to Thomas Cole's The Course of Empire. In, in these years, 1992-93, he created two series which he called the Course of Empire. Um, there were five part series that responded to his take on the drastic changes taking place in the Los Angeles um, landscape, uh, his native Los Angeles. And again, many of the themes in Cole's Course of Empire came into play. And this series actually was shown in London at the National Gallery adjacent to our Thomas Cole exhibition. And it was just thrilling to hear Ed Ruscha talk about how influential um, that Thomas Cole had been to him as an artist. Um, and then finally, um, in recent time, there was a wonderful exhibition um, uh, called Cross Pollination, Heed Cole Church in Our Contemporary Moment. There was a great uh, sharing of an uh, uh, exhibition between the uh, Olana, which is directly across from the Cole Homestead. As many of you know, Church was so devoted to his mentor, Thomas Cole, that um, Olana is built directly across from Cole's um, uh, farm house, which you can see in one of these images, um, so that he never uh, lost sight of the great lessons he learned from his mentor. So, this show was shared by the, those two institutions in 2020, and it's currently at Crystal Bridges Museum. Um, so you can see it there, but it was a wonderful, it, its core was um, borrowing uh, the great series um, by Martin Johnson Heed of his hummingbird paintings, the gems of Brazil. Heed is another artist that requires much more research. He's so fascinating and like Church, was very inspired by science, by um, Humboldt, by Darwin, um, and he was obsessed with the pollination of um, orchids and different flowers uh, in the tropics. 
And so the entire series was on view in the show. And then both Nicole Homestead and Alana commissioned a series of well-known contemporary artists to respond to Hudson River School artists' works, which were on view at Alana. So here on the right, you see um, at the Cole uh, Homestead, the great artists Mark Dion and Dana Sherwood built a pollinator pavilion, a direct response to the heat paintings. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience um, to go into this um, sort of outdoor arbor, um, which had a lot of wonderful references to hummingbirds um, in it. And so um, this, this uh, continues on. I have to say the Hudson River School um, artists and their works continue to be of great fascination, not just to um, scholars and curators like myself, but um, in this moment um, where we're um, it really confronting um, horrific climate change, um, it's really fascinating to look back in time to see how many of these artists were starting to grapple with these issues at that time and to see how they incorporate messages into their landscapes. Um, and that our contemporary artists are now taking up the climate crisis as one of the most important subjects for their art. And so I know your show will be uh, very popular, um, but it, I think this particular theme of the new discipline of eco-criticism being applied to both artists from earlier times and artists uh, of contemporary time um, is probably the most powerful. So um, I encourage you to go see the show and thank you all for tuning in today. And I'm happy to answer questions that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Betsy. That was wonderful. Thank you for bringing us through the ages and to contemporary and what a perfect ending. It was a wonderful installation at Cedar Grove. And we do have questions and people are chatting them. And if you're if you're okay with that and having them emailed to you, you might be able sure. to richer no problem, responses yeah. than uh, <laughs> we have time for. And we're just thrilled that you have uh, opened up this exhibition for us with um, just wonderful perspectives as always in enriching our understanding of Hudson River School painting, painters. And uh, we really can't thank you enough for being with us this, this afternoon. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Our marketing folks have told us to please check our website uh, at the exhibition page where this talk will be posted uh, later this week on our YouTube channel and we hope that you will join us for the rest of the lectures coming up uh, each month. So please do check our website and thank you all for your participation and support of the MBMAA. Have a wonderful day.